you hear that sound? Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Or is it something else? Something insane? Yes, it is. It's a car. It's a car powered by a turbine. It's a turbine-powered car that could only come from those crazy engineers over at the Chrysler Corporation. Welcome everyone to the 46th episode of the Automotive History Series, where we are going to take a closer look at the futuristic turbine car program of the Chrysler Corporation. <sighs> Let's do this intro one more time. In the 1950s, the American public was treated on ever more flashy and futuristic cars. The space age was in full swing, and although the design of many of these cars sometimes got a bit too much ahead of what the cars were actually had to offer underneath all the flashy chrome, the 50s were a time of many innovations. But in the deepest of the departments of the big three automakers, the mad scientists were hard at work to see if they could bring car technology to the next level, by looking at other ways to power cars than just regular gas. General Motors had a very brief look at solar-powered cars and the Ford Motor Company once took a short dive into trying to run cars on nuclear energy. Yes, that's right, the Ford Nucleon was a proposed design with a little nuclear reactor in the back. And I wonder what the insurance rates were on a car like this. But as you'll expect, both electric and nuclear-powered cars were impractical and no match for the conventional and easy-to-use, fill-it-up-everywhere gas-powered car and those fuel prices were getting more affordable each year. But it was the Chrysler Corporation that would give the gas turbine as a drivetrain a second thought, and actually went through with this development so far to try and see if they could make it ready for regular production. Turbines, or turbines, potato potato, or is it tomato tomato? I like tomatoes. Turbines, especially gas-powered turbines, were somewhat of a hot topic during the 50s. Actual application of the concept started in the 1930s, and by the 1940s, because of the Second World War, also found its way into airplanes. And since the car industry likes to borrow a whole lot from the aircraft industry, like design principles and technology, the idea of putting the same type of engine found in airplanes into cars was an easy brainwave. But why the hell would you shove an airplane-like engine into a car, uh, other than that it sounds cool, figuratively, but also literally? What was the added value in that? I'm not going to explain a turbine engine in great detail. From a scale of Jeremy Clarkson to Nikolai Tesla, I feel like a solid Edward today, so I'll, I'll keep it simple. Turbines have the great advantage over regular piston engines that it has a lot less moving parts. This is great for overall reliability and the engine is also vibration free, allowing for a very smooth ride. Some other advantages include a longer engine life, fewer engine repairs, no warm-up time needed, no engine stalling, almost no oil consumption and it runs on many different types of fuels other than regular gas. And you cannot deny that these are very attractive qualities for a drivetrain from a consumer point of view. And Chrysler thought the same. Imagine being the first car company ever to offer an entirely new type of futuristic drivetrain that could beat the conventional piston engine in every way. But in order to get there, there are a few challenges that had to be solved. The Chrysler Corporation started to take an interest in the development of turbine-powered cars at the start of the 1950s, and they quickly found a man that was fit for the task, George Eubner. Although an engineer at heart, Eubner was the golden combination of the dry and boring know-how of mechanical engineering and a face and know-how of how to make it all sound sexy and generate publicity. Eubner, nicknamed Mr. Turbin, and an assigned team were tasked with the goal to bring the gas-powered turbin from the airplane industry into the automotive world. In order to make the turbine engine fit in the engine bay of a regular passenger car, the team had to design a smaller version that would still meet its advantages. Components had to be reduced in size but at the same time increase in efficiency. And not only that, there were some other challenges that had to be dealt with. Turbine engines tend to generate a lot of noise, so the team looked for ways to make it quieter. The engine also had to be just as fuel efficient, if not more, compared to a regular piston engine. And the team needed to do something about the extremely hot exhaust fumes, standing too close to an exhaust and it could lead to serious injuries. And the whole package had to be fairly inexpensive to be mass produced to remain competitive. 
a tough nut to crack, but after a couple years of development, the team released the first version of the car-based turbine engine and managed to deal with some of the challenges through a nifty invention, the regenerator. The turning point was the development of a rotary heat exchanger, which converted exhaust heat into a strong power boost with fuel economy. So essentially, it's kind of like a turbo. The first prototype that made around 100 horsepower was installed in a 1954 Plymouth Sports Coupe that they had lying around at the time, and it all fit neatly in the engine bay. Using the Plymouth, Chrysler officially announced that they were working on the new and revolutionary turbine program, and showed the car on many press events. But the car came with a big disclosure. The beginning is here, we prove it's possible to install a functioning turbine in a car, the test results have been promising, but we still have a long way to go before a car such as this would ever reach the showrooms. The following year, full of confidence this project might go somewhere, Chrysler did more real-world testing in a 55 Plymouth in and around Detroit, but did not make a big fuss about it in the press. This changed a year later, in 1956. In that year, Chrysler wanted to test the long-term reliability of the engine under continuous stress through a cross-country road trip. This time, a four-door 1956 Plymouth started its 3,000-mile or almost 5,000-kilometer trip from the Chrysler building in New York City to City Hall in Los Angeles. The car completed the trip massively, with no engine problems whatsoever, and with a fuel consumption of about 13 miles per gallon, or 18 liters per 100 kilometers, which was very much the standard at the time. Another victory, and a couple years later, Chrysler released a second generation of the turbine engine, further improved and upgraded based on the results from the previous tests, like the transcontinental road trip. In 1958, Chrysler released a new prototype of the turbine engine, now with 200 horsepower, a much improved regenerator, burner and compressor. And not only the components were better, also the metals used to build the engine were a lot more heat resistant, easier to fabricate and cheaper. Now this... this is getting somewhere. Chrysler decided to step it up a notch. By the start of the 1960s, with serious implementation in the back of their minds, Chrysler wanted to bring the turbine car program back into the public picture. And in order to do that, Chrysler installed the engine in three vehicles. The first one was the bizarre turboflight concept car. Although nothing more than just a styling gimmick, back then this was the way to bring new drivetrain technology, along with some other fantastical features to the attention of the general public at car shows, and generate excitement. This was the attention grabber. The second car was once again a regular production car. A 1960 Plymouth with a slightly revised front end. This one was used for testing the turbine in regular passenger cars and for journalists to try out. So this was the real deal. And the last car was a bit more interesting. A Dodge Freight Truck. Simply to show that A, the turbine engine will fit in any car, and B, the turbine engine also provides plenty of power and was suitable enough for the more rugged vehicles for the toughest jobs, like freight trucks. By 1962, Chrysler sent a 62 Dodge Dart once again on a transcontinental trip in the dead of winter, the same one they did back in 56. The car's exterior design, that was already unusual to begin with, psst, watch episode 18 for more info, swapped its grill inserted headlights with styling elements that were referenced to turbine engines. The Dart completed the trip once again flawlessly, no problems whatsoever, and the turbine turned out to be even more fuel efficient than a regular gas engine for a trip like that. The Turbo Dart, no not the turbine, but Turbo, that completed the trip was part of a group of four Turbo, uh, Turbo, uh, no, Turbo cars. Two Turbo Darts and two Turbo Furies. These cars were used for promotional purposes. They went on a tour throughout the major cities in the US to gauge public reaction. First, the local press was invited to test the cars and then they were shown at local dealers so that the public could see, hear, smell and touch what these cars were about. Afterwards, those that were interested could fill out a survey with the question if they would buy a car with this type of engine. 30% said yes, definitely, and another 54% answered, hmm, most likely. Alright, Chrysler had a revolutionary engine that was thoroughly tested, rivaled the conventional piston engine, generated enough interest from people that were also willing to buy it. Let's go and make an actual turbine car! 
Now, Chrysler could just implement the turbine engine in their regular production cars and sell them to the public. But before they had plans to do that, they wanted to introduce turbine cars with a massive bang. And in order to do that, Chrysler figured it would build a limited run of special models, about 50 cars that would be delivered to randomly chosen drivers for a limited time. Just your average Joes and Janes that would take them to work, shopping and leisurely drives, and hopefully would return them with nothing but praise. To stand out from the rest of all the traffic, the car should receive a special styling treatment. A normal passenger car, four seats, two doors. The styling should be distinctive, but not as radical and as impractical as a turboflight concept for instance, but also not too boring that it was indistinguishable from the rest of the Chrysler cars. The task of designing the car was given to a new colleague in the Chrysler design department. Elwood Engel, the man who made name and fame by designing the fresh and modernistic Lincoln Continental a few years prior. He replaced his predecessor, Virgil Exner, after the Pluck a Chicken debacle. Psst, once again, episode 18 for more info. Maybe, Chrysler thought, let's uh, Engel have a go at designing this limited production car. If he screws up, it won't be too bad, but if he succeeds, uh, then he can design more cars. Who knows? Engel was a man that liked to stick to design elements that worked before, like formal roofs and not too fuzzy designs, and threw in some turbine design references for good measure. He drew inspiration from his previous success stories like the Continental and the Ford Thunderbird, but especially from a concept car he co-designed when he worked at Ford in 1958. The eventual Chrysler turbine car shows an uncanny resemblance with the 1958 Ford LaGalaxy concept car. Coincidence? I think not. The car featured a simple front end with two headlights inserted into massive air scoop like holes as a reference to the turbine engines under the wings of airplanes. The rear end styling was more unique with a W like shape and in the massive cutouts the rocket shaped tail lights point outwards and inside them were the turbine exhausts. The car only came in a noticeable turbine bronze. The interior was luxuriously equipped with all the latest options and equipment put into it, like power brakes, power windows, power steering, and with a center console that looked like an actual turbine engine that was placed directly in the middle, but that was a fake. To spice things up a bit, the car's bodywork were designed in America but built in Italy by Italian coach builder Ghia, uh, Chrysler had done some business with them in previous years. The cars would then be shipped back to the US where Chrysler would do the rest, like installing the engine. This Turbo Thunderbird, uh, Turbine Bird, uh, Turbine Car was released on May 14, 1963 and shown to the press and public. The 50 cars were then given to randomly chosen people, either young or old, male or female, doesn't matter, from a pool of 30,000 people that sent letters to participate. They would own the car for three months and then it would be passed on to other people for another three months. Chrysler would give the cars for free and paid for the insurance and road tax. The drivers only had to take reasonable care for the car and pay for fuel. In total, 203 drivers got an ultra rare chance to drive the car. Their reactions were well documented. Almost all of the drivers agreed that the turbine truly was a vibration free engine with a gliding sensation. They also believed that the maintenance would be low on such an engine, although that was hard to tell by owning the car for only three months. Drivers were a bit divided on the noise, some found it to be a cool sound, others found it to still be a bit noisy, and then there were people that found the noise levels on all speeds tolerable, but the only main disadvantage was the fuel consumption. Many drivers noticed it was considerably worse compared to regular piston engines, but that could also be part of frequent stop and go traffic and idling when showing the car to other people. But that was only about the operation of the engine. Owners also reported that with driving an instant attention grabbing sensation. People broke their necks when a turbine car would pass by. It sounded so different, like an airplane, and it looked so cool. Owners reported that as soon as they left the car somewhere to do business, upon return a group of curious people would always gather around the car and look at it. Regular drivers became movie stars overnight. Did the oh so long promised future of cars finally arrive? 
Overall, what the drivers experienced in these three months confirmed what Chrysler thought. The turbine engine was a damn fine engine that could start to replace the piston engine. It was time for a new revolution in the development of the automobile. It was time of the arrival of the large-scale production of turbine-powered cars. Every light was green when it comes to the full-scale production of turbine engines. Except for one, cost. Chrysler had everything figured out, but in order to produce turbine engines properly, a new special factory had to be built, which would cost around one billion dollars, and mind you, 1960s dollars. The total price of a production turbine car would cost at least ten thousand dollars, and for that kind of money, you could buy two nice Cadillacs. Oof. But Chrysler wouldn't give up. It once again developed a new generation for the engine based on the feedback of the turbine car drivers program and planned to install them as a limited run in 500 1966 Dodge Chargers. And mind you, this year the Charger was designed and intended to be some sort of a high style personal luxury car and not a muscle car. A turbine engine option would greatly help creating an exclusive luxury image. The idea never materialized as some other things happened that had a negative effect on the program. First of all, after the styling fiasco of the early 60s, once again episode 18, Chrysler lost a lot of money due to lower sales, not to mention the bags of money Chrysler threw at the turbine program. Second, Chrysler started to have doubts whether it really wanted to go through with setting up a full-scale production line of turbine engines, mostly because of a third reason. And the third reason is that around the mid-60s, the US government started to actively interfere with the car industry. Several government agencies set up rules and laws regarding the safety and, above all, the emissions of passenger cars. The industry had to comply, and every year the rules were getting stricter and stricter. Especially the emission of nitrogen oxide, one of the largest contributors of air pollution, had to be reduced. And that was a tough job to pull off in and on itself on regular piston engines, let alone experimental turbine technology. So, if Chrysler wanted to continue, they had to support a program by developing an engine that was ever more efficient, also had to comply with the latest and greatest emission laws, find out how to lower production costs of this engine, all the while being very tight on money. I don't have to tell you that this is a series of unfortunate events. Chrysler greatly reduced its interest and effort in the turbine car program. People expected a lot after the turbine car pilot and the showings of the World Fair, but in the meantime, Chrysler only focused on further developing the engine and not to make a switch to full-scale production. A new sixth generation was developed that actually met the new regulations and was installed in a 1966 Dodge Coronet. More developments followed in the later 60s with this car as the template, but the emission rules were getting stricter and stricter, and eventually Chrysler decided to move the engineers from the turbine department to the regular piston engine department, as all the time and expertise was needed for Chrysler regular engines to meet the new rules. In the early 70s, Chrysler continued to develop the engine with limited funds, partly thanks to a grant from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, who saw an opportunity in alternative fuel vehicles during the dark days of energy crisis after energy crisis. This led to a seventh generation engine that was once again very promising, as it nearly met all the requirements. It almost bordered on being the holy grail of turbine engines, except for the NOx emissions. The engine was installed in various cars not shown to the public, one of which was a slightly customized 1977 Chrysler LeBaron. The car featured an aerodynamic design with hidden headlights and a sharp and slim center waterfall grille. But alas, the turbine engine remained competitive with the regular piston engine, but never gained an advantage over it and was no longer deemed as a promising alternative. The last turbine-powered car made by Chrysler was an ordinary-looking 1980 Dodge Murata. These were the years that Chrysler had its hands full with the ever more strict emission regulations, and on top of that made some mistakes in the previous years, which led to a race to bankruptcy. Chrysler was granted a loan from the US government on the condition to cut down cost, a multi-million turbine program, with no promising future that kept on burning money could no longer be justified. And after 30 years of endless trying, the program was scrapped. 
Let's jump back in time for a moment, because after the program with the 50 turbine cars had ended, where did these cars go? It was a common industry practice that as soon as car companies were done showing the concept cars, they ordered them to be demolished or stored somewhere secret. Some designers managed to get their hands on the creations they worked on, but were mostly forbidden to drive them out in the open. But the Chrysler Turbine car wasn't a one-off concept car, it was a limited run model. How did that work out? After all the cars had been returned, Chrysler was faced with a challenge. Since the car bodies were built and imported from Italy, the US Customs gave Chrysler a choice. Either pay the import duties directly, or bring them in without paying, but you either have to destroy the cars, or send them back from where they came from. Chrysler decided to only pay for some of the cars and destroy the rest, simply because Chrysler couldn't pay the import duties on all cars, and that is the story Chrysler also told to the press. But there is a bit of a debate on this. Chrysler spent so much money on building these cars in Italy, so these import duties would only be a fraction of the price. Instead, I think it has something to do with what I just mentioned, the industry practice of getting rid of cars like this. Risk management. If some of the 50 cars ended up in private hands, and someone got the genius idea to take the car to the races and a crash happens, a carefully constructed image that took a decade or two of showing turbine engines was the way of the future would instantly be blown to pieces. Turbine cars crash, aren't safe, see I told you, etc etc, you get the idea. Chrysler was desperately trying to send 10 of the cars to museums and institutions for educational purposes, and the rest was getting scrapped. There is some footage of the cars being crushed, but what you didn't see were the engineers looking through the fence crying, because they saw their dreams, works and achievements being crushed in a matter of seconds.